Putt Shack is the only high-tech miniature golf location in the world. Nobody else can do what we do. Entertainment. It's everywhere. Whether it's being active or on our phones, we want it, we need it, we crave it. In a world where our attention spans swing every which way, companies now have to find new avenues to keep us engaged. Socializing? Meh. But competitive socializing? We're here for it. Just ask Putt Shack CEO, Joe Franken. We've now reinvented a game that hasn't changed in over 100 years. You can only get this experience at a Putt Shack. The challenge to being relevant within competitive socializing is how do you take the concept, continue to innovate it? It's not rocket science to be successful in this space. It's a fun and compelling activity. It's really good food and beverage. It's a great guest service experience. But the reality is we can do things that our competitive set just doesn't have the ability to do. All right, first things first, remember always here, but again, if you look away, we got the three cameras, but always just try to stay on that camera. Mm -hmm. All right, for those who don't know, what is Putt Shack? Putt Shack is the only high-tech miniature golf location in the world. And when I say high-tech, inside every golf ball essentially is a mini iPad. So there is a computer processor, a battery system, Bluetooth enabled. The ball is tracked on every inch of every hole. You don't have to be a golfer to come out to Putt Shack. It's an easy activity to do, and it's fun and engaging whether you're 10 years old or 90 years old. Every one of our holes is specifically designed for our core demographic of 21 to 39 year olds. So we have a beer pong hole, we have a roulette hole, we'll have a true false trivia pursuit hole. And because the game scores for you automatically, our guests can be completely immersed within the experience. We've created a way to play this game that is just more fun and engaging than it has been. The game hadn't changed in over 100 years in, until the inventors of Putt Shack were able to reinvent the way you can play it. So one thing I wanted to mention when I was growing up, when we were at a competitive social uh, locations, places to go to, it's usually chicken fingers and pizza. This does not look like that. Can you explain why the experience at Putt Shack for food and beverages? I mean, look at the cocktails. These are not, these are dishes that you'd see at a very nice restaurant. So can you talk about uh, what kind of offerings you have at each location? The food is as important as the game experience for all of our guests. So we created a menu with global food flavors. Um, and so this is at least a somewhat of a representation of, of what our menu has. A lot of competitive socializing, they'll generate 12 to less than 20% of the revenue from the activity and the rest is food and beverage. Or it's all activity and then the food and beverage side is just kind of food that comes out in a plastic basket. If you are generating the majority of your revenue on the food and beverage side, so let's say 85% of your revenue is coming from food and beverage, then when you run into difficult economic times, you're really running a business that's a bar restaurant. The mix of revenue between your game revenue and your food and beverage is a huge component of what you can do as an overall business over the long term. We generate about 45% of our revenue from the game activity and then 55% uh, of our revenue from food and beverage. Um, on the food and beverage side, about two thirds of that comes from beverage and one third of that comes from the food side. Awesome. Well. I don't want to keep sitting here and staring at this food. Let's eat, and then I have to kick your ass in golf. So let's rock you and roll. You'll be the first to kick my ass in golf. So. <laughs> Do you want to start us off? I'm going to have you start us off. Okay. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to crush me. Yeah, yeah. You're, you, now you, you want me to I'm, go first. Yeah, now I'm getting sheepish. <laughs> Do you consider yourself like more on the aggressive side of mini golf or conservative golf player? Aggressive side, but that doesn't necessarily pay off all the time. If you're comfortable sharing, how much would each location hopefully roughly bring in per year? Sure, I mean, when we originally modeled out what a US location would do, we modeled out that we could do about $10.5 million per venue. We've raised $100 million in equity and then $150 million of senior debt. We'd raise $63 million in, 
in equity in 2021. And going into 2022, our goal was to secure a senior debt facility of at least 75 million with the goal of 150 million. And it was a pretty ambitious goal because we had only opened two US locations and we will open eight locations this year in 2023. We would like to open a minimum of 10 locations beginning in 2024 and every year thereafter. So we wanted to make sure that we had the capital that was going to be able to build everything in 2024 and into 2025. Dead. Well done. Oh, sorry, Steve. All right, thank you. Can we elaborate on the technology in each ball and why this is special to Pachak? Sure. We own the concept patent around automatic scoring within miniature golf. Okay. Which is really powerful because even if somebody put different technology in the golf ball that did scoring, it would violate the patent that we own because we own the concept of automatic scoring in miniature golf. So what we have that developers and landlords really want, we bring a demographic that is very hard to get to today. Right? So our core demographic is 21 to 39, and we are almost exactly split 50-50 male-female. Our average venue will do between 425 and 500,000 visits per year per location. Finding landlords who want a putt shack as part of their development, that's not the challenge. The challenge for us is finding the right locations and then at the right deal terms. So for us, one of our cornerstones is we never want to sign a lease to open a new venue unless we know we have the money to build that venue. Part of the reason that we, we raised the capital that we did is we're very ambitious in how we want to grow Putchak. Our team is pretty conservative in the way we look at things. And so we look to say, okay, everything that we're trying to do in growing this business, what are the risks and how do we de-risk that? I know you, you talked about your wife being a huge support system, but who are you most thankful for in your career? Truthfully, it is my wife. I mean, I've been blessed to have a lot of leaders that I have learned from. But in my whole career, I'm most thankful for the support that I do get from my wife. So you and your wife, I get, I'm giving you the ability to teleport anywhere. You don't even have to take the plane trip. You know, you can go anywhere you want. Where are you going? Rome and then down to the Amalfi Coast. The powers that be said you, you can't be in this business anymore. You can't be in competitive social. You can't be running Putt Shack. What other industry or company would you run? I haven't given it a whole lot of thought, to be honest, because I really focus on, on what, I'm, what I'm doing today. I think if I wasn't involved in competitive socializing, I would look to see if there was a business that I could be involved in that helped, that was more mental health driven in helping people. Did you always want to be a CEO when you were growing up? Did you have other aspirations when you were younger? Uh, ironically, uh, this is kind of what I uh, dreamed of doing, um, either being a CEO or owning a business. I, from the time I was very young, I really wanted the opportunity to see if I could lead a company and grow a company. What do you do to de-stress? I do like to be around water. I like fishing. Do you have a book or a, a, a book about business, being a CEO, leader that you would recommend to other people? Yeah, I really like a book called Outliers uh, from uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, um, I, I really found that book to be incredibly interesting about you know what are the things that can make for high performing people. Are you watching anything on TV? Any TV series that we should know that you're you're binging? <laughs> so for me, it, that is part of my de stressing and relaxing, and and I kind of like things that are uh, more on the. Uh, chill humorous side, so I'm kind of like a, a Big Bang Theory fanatic, um, those kind of shows. Nice. So you've been a CEO in the past before, uh, this isn't your first rodeo. What advice would you give to a young CEO who came to you and said, you know, it's my first time being a CEO and I'm, I'm looking for some of your wisdom in this role? Sure. Um, I actually spend a fair amount of time now with first time CEOs who are asking me some of that exact question. Um, and I think a lot of first time CEOs have uh, what I'll call a poser syndrome. You know, you work to get to that, to that pinnacle um, and then you have this insecurity of, am I, am I good enough? Um, and, and people are gonna realize I'm not. And, and the reality is you have to recognize that there are gonna be a lot of things that you don't know you want to embrace that and learn from that. 
you don't have to know everything. So when working with a board of directors as an example, you know, you want to be able to lead the company and lead the board, um, but do it with humility and recognize that there's just going to be a lot of things that you know and you're comfortable with, but there's also going to be things that everybody, you know, you're just not going to know, and that's okay. Um, and if I knew, if I was comfortable with that the first time around, I think I would have been a better leader. Advice to someone starting a business. So advice to somebody who is starting a business, starting a true startup is incredibly hard. Um, and you're going to have to be really tenacious in order to overcome all of the hurdles and obstacles that will, will be put in front of you. Um, so you, you have to really have that mentality of never give up, whatever that obstacle is, find a way to go through it, go around it, um, whatever it takes. Um, and be patient because the you know growing a business never happens as quickly as you would like it to um, and so putting that together and moving and, and really driving it it takes hard work patience and tenacity Joe thanks so much for having us really appreciate it love learning well, thanks about for coming Jack yeah it was so fun and, and congratulations on the win yeah <laughs> thank you I'm excited to come here with friends I'll buy you a drink now. yeah yeah perfect <laughs> It's only 11 a.m. <laughs> <laughs>